Good evening to everyone who have joined us today. I'm Dr. Saumya, consultant pathologist, Triastar Sciences uh, Lab, HCG Hospital, Bangalore, and I'll be moderating the session today. I'm pleased to welcome our chief patron uh, for the digital pathology course, Dr. Vijay Chandru, co-founder and chairman of Strand Life Sciences. Dr. B.S. Ajay Kumar, executive chairman, HCG Hospitals. However, sir is unable to join us today. Our course director, Dr. Veena Ramaswamy, course faculty, Dr. Sandeep Rao, consultant pathologist and head of hematopathology, HCG Bangalore, and Dr. Bakul Goel, who is an assistant professor at Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information and Communication Technology, Gandhi Nagar, and all our delegates. I'd like to start the event with a brief introduction about Go Global Healthcare Academy, which has been instituted with the mission to develop competent and compassionate human resources for the healthcare sector. It also promotes innovative solutions and enterprises in healthcare. Our core purpose is to bridge the skill and knowledge gap between formal education and, ne and needs uh, to the healthcare industry. Uh, the GHA is led, managed, and advised by reputed doctors and healthcare professionals. Digital technology is entering into an exciting time with more widespread use uh, use of digital imaging in pathology in particular, uh, with the introduction of uh, whole slide imaging technology. In the last five years, we have witnessed an increasing use of machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence tools making their way into the healthcare. Thus, the timing is right for digital disruption to occur in diagnostic pathology. Before we invite Dr. Veena to brief us about the digital pathology course, I would like to introduce her to our delegates. Dr. Veena is a consultant pathologist and head of histopathology at TriStar Sciences, HCG Hospital, Bangalore. She has over 20 years of experience in various fields of surgical pathology with a keen interest in digital pathology. She also heads digital pathology at HCG as a project in charge. She is instrumental in deploying in the deployment of digital pathology in HCG network, she is actively involved in several clinical trials, some of which are on artificial intelligence and machine learning in pathology and healthcare. Uh, Dr. Veena is a Sigma Green Belt holder from IIT Delhi. She also holds a postgraduate certificate course on artificial intelligence for leaders from University of Texas. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Soumya. Am I audible? Yes, doctor. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Can I share my screen? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Soumya, for the introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. B.S. Ajay Kumar, Chairman of HCG Hospitals, for being such a wonderful support throughout our journey in digital pathology. So he has been a pioneer in India to implement a uh, digital pathology solution in HCG. It has been recognized as a 100 person digital pathology laboratory in the laboratory in the entire country. So but, uh, we are very thankful to him for, uh, for opening up this uh, sort of educative sessions to everybody who can make use of these educative sessions for their self-awareness, self-development and knowledge, and also to implement these solutions in their own workplaces. I would also like to thank Dr. Vijay Chandru, uh, our patron for this course, and he has been such a wonderful support and has done enormous amount of work in digitization, and we will be hearing soon from him. Uh, I would I'll also like to thank uh, Dr. Anita and her team at GHA for an initiative, taking this initiative and supporting us to bring out this program, which will help everybody, not only the pathologists, the technicians, as well as the data scientists who are now keen in working on artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. So digital pathology has to longer the future. People still think that it is the future, but we have to realize that it is no longer the future. 
it is the present today let's see what it is so the digitization in pathology does not just end with scanning a slide and generating a whole slide image you need on our desktops and then just signing out the report this actually involves a wide uh, workflow which includes you know orienting the people then evaluating the systems successfully implementing it and also you know, making your clinicians aware of the advantages that digital pathology carries the need for digitization actually arises basically from the clinical practice so that we know that there is increasing case load so we are seeing so many cases that are coming to the hospital particularly the oncology cases and also the complexity of the cases are increasing so it's no longer the simple text descriptions the histopathology reports that we used to sign out earlier but now the histopathology reports the hematology reports are becoming more objective and evidence based and we also realize that there is shortage of skilled staff not only the pathologists and even the technicians and also the data scientists who understand what is digitization and what is a data that an unsupervised data that is generated from this there is an increase in need for understanding the digital pathology and its applications it it helps the pathologists in collaboration so we know that sometimes we need expert opinion so with a whole slide image we can easily connect with our colleagues anywhere and we can take opinion so there is a support from a digital pathology uh, system it is the requirement we are in the era of precision oncology where we we actually um, the treatment for the patients are decided based on his genetic workup and there are so many other targeted therapies the biomarker research that is happening so that the treatment protocols are tailor made for each patient so hence pathology has to keep abreast with these requirements from the clinical clinicians that is why digital pathology is one such tool which will help the pathologists to keep abreast with the clinicians require requirements there is enormous amount of data generated through these whole slide images and management of this data and the future application of this data in the practice of precision oncology is very important and that is the need of the r not only for developing algorithms but also helping the pathologists in their routine diagnostic practice and also this provides an opportunity for the pathologists to interact with the data scientists closely so that whatever is developed can be effectively implemented in the clinical practice so there is the, this is creating an opportunity for in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning for developing various algorithms which have clinical utility which will reduce the turnaround time for the patients and will also reduce the cost hence the digital pathology acts as a bridge between the radiology and the genomics technology so as i just enumerated the technology including staging through the, uh, several measurements etc then collaboration with the experts becomes easy remote reporting so you can sit at the comforts of your homes and report the cases it improves the efficiency of the entire laboratory it reduces inter observer variability supports in decision making by providing objective evidences and it's very ergonomically designed so there is no strain on the eyes the postures etc and as i said it provides the platform for the application of computational pathology which means the application of artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms in pathology and for data scientists there is a huge digital data that is generated through the pathology images which can be used as a bridge either to work on radiology or on genomics or act as a tool for developing radio histogenomics algorithms this is the reason we thought that we need to have a a course which will actually uh, provide a platform for everybody not only the pathologists the data scientists the technologists everybody to understand what are the advantages of this technology the pathology we still have sort of closed mind for digital pathology so i think it is high time that we open our eyes and look at this technology because this is the future so we don't need we don't have to miss the bus so let us wake up and understand the technology so we are through program we are trying to provide a platform 
also providing an um, overall overview of how to implement digital pathology solution in your organizations if at all you wish to do it so we we can also we will be uh, providing you some information on how to select the scanners how how to optimize your workflow how to manage your data etc through this program and we we will also be providing you some guidance on validation of digital pathology solution so we have guidelines from cap we have guidelines from royal college of pathologists we have the digital pathology association who have provided guidelines for the implementation of the digital pathology particularly through the pathology discourse uh, for the pathologists so but we can also uh, through this program we are also providing a platform for you to understand how to validate the pathology systems in your organizations and then we are also planning to provide an exposure to computational pathology that is integration of the digital pathology data the digital images with the artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm so we are trying to bridge the gap that is existing between pathology and the data scientists and this concept actually came came to our mind when we also started working on ai ml projects and we started realizing that there is a huge gap between what is expected data scientists and what is actually interpreted by the pathologists so there was a huge gap so the what we were able telling the data scientists were not able to capture and what the data scientists wanted we were not able to understand so finally that is when we decided that we need to provide a platform for everybody to bridge this gap between the data scientists and the pathologists thereby the application of these algorithms the digital pathology solution becomes easy for everybody ultimately helping the patients in the better management of the patients so as dr samya said hcd is the first 100% digital pathology laboratory in the country uh, since the last 4 years and we have been the first laboratory in the country to apply artificial intelligence machine learning based breast biomarker algorithm for disease and this is our setup in our organization and hcg has been a part of several projects on ai ml algorithms and we do understand what is required by the data scientists and what we as pathologists expect from the data scientists so this is where we feel that we would be able to provide a platform and guide the pathologists as well as the data scientists in understanding this technology better in fact some of our students have got into the um, um, uh, ai ml uh, projects and they have been working with uh, some companies who are purely into data management and developing these algorithms so that's why the digital pathology and through the artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms developments is also providing a job opportunity for pathologists and similarly for data scientists providing them a platform to understand how the pathology images are generated how they are managed how they are interpreted by a pathologist will also make them understand better when an image is interpreted by the pathologist so through this program uh, we are providing a platform for everybody to understand this technology and the main objective of the course is to completely familiarize the learners with all aspects of digital pathology as i said including the selection of a scanner optimization of the workflow then different protocols different use cases the applications where all can you use digital pathology images what are the regulatory requirements how do we validate etc so this is our main objective of the program to provide a platform for everybody to understand this technology so we expect that at the completion of the course the participants will be confident enough to take up projects related relating to digital pathology uh, systems and will also be able to apply these technology in their own organizations or the laboratories so this course actually has mainly online lectures some of which are pre recorded and some are live lectures and some are going to be interactive sessions so this course not only involves the digital pathology in histopathology but we are also providing a platform to learn the application of digital pathology artificial intelligence machine learning in hematopathology so this is this is providing a dual platform in both histopathology and hematopathology so after the online lectures the interactive sessions learning material will also be made available to all the participants and if possible a site visit and orientation on site will also be provided to all the participants so basically 12 sessions 
which includes different topics of digital pathology applications or digital pathology solution implementation in the laboratory. And each session will be of one hour duration and live sessions will definitely be interactive. So we want people to come out with more questions and uh, uh, ask questions so that it stimulates us also to look into other areas and get the knowledge. So I, um, as I said, uh, through this course, we welcome the data scientists to join us. And uh, as you know, this is a, a unique course. And I don't think anybody in India has this sort of a course where they are providing a platform on digital pathology for both the medical medicine and the engineering uh, uh, faculties. So, and we have excellent faculty, um, Dr. Soumya, Dr. Sandeep, my colleague, and uh, as well as we have Dr. Bakul, who's a very uh, uh, experienced uh, 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 faculty in our data management. So we will be having a wonderful session in the, in the coming uh, uh, course. So thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Dr. Soumya. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So next up is the keynote address by Dr. Vijay Chandru. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vijay Chandru, who co-founded Strand Life Sciences in 2000 with Dr. Ramesh Hariharan as a spin-off from the prestigious Indian Institute of uh, Science, Bangalore. Uh, he is an academic entrepreneur recognized as a technology pioneer by the uh, World Economic Forum in 2006. His academic career has spanned over two decades at uh, Purdue University and um, Indian Institute of Science. Uh, Dr. Chandru is a recipient of uh, several awards and honors uh, as a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences, MCIT Devang Mehta Award for Innovation in IT, uh, UGC Hari Om Trust Award for Science and Society, the President's Medal for Informs in 2006, Distinguished Alumni Award by MIT India Program in 2007, and was recognized as the Biospectrum Biotech Entrepreneur of 2007. Dr. Chandru also serves as an advisor to the Karnataka State Council on Science and Technology and on the Atal Innovation Mission at the National Institute for Transforming India in New Delhi. He also holds a PhD from MIT. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Uh, Dr. Vijay Chandru, sir, are you there? Um, Hello, can you hear me? Uh, uh, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, uh, my laptop has crashed. It's a little embarrassing, but I have not been able to bring it up. Uh, I have mailed uh, Dr. Veena the link uh, for my presentation on the cloud. Okay, uh, just, just a minute, sir. I'll just open yeah. it for you. Yeah, please. Huh? Thank you. So uh, while it comes up, maybe I'll just uh, thank you for uh, the kind of introduction and also for um, uh, inviting me to uh participate uh, uh, i actually uh thought i would give a little more of a an overview or introduction to artificial intelligence and machine learning um because sometimes it's really useful to know what is behind this magic right because i think uh we all uh, sometimes think it's something, you know, quite, uh, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, out of reach, but it's actually uh, some fairly simple ideas that have been pulled together. 
but it is the, the fact that uh, computational power has become quite amazing that uh, that we are able to do some of these things. But uh, uh, Dr. Veena, we, uh, have you been able to find the link or? I had sent it to you on WhatsApp. Uh, sir, uh, it's so. Uh, can you see the presentation, sir? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. One second, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vignesh, are you uh, presenting? Mr. Vignesh? It's getting open now. Oh, it's getting open? Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about this. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we understand uh, the technology. Uh, thanks. <laughs> no, no. It's, uh, uh, I'm supposed to be... Uh, it's been too kind okay. of you to have me time for this. <laughs> right. No, no. Unfortunately, I was able to get the link from the cloud, so I just sent it across. Yeah. Uh, there, something is opening. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you can, yeah, just move to the next slide, please. I've been introduced already. Yeah, so, um, you know, basically uh, the field of artificial intelligence uh, goes back to the late 50s, early 60s. And, uh, you know, Herbert Simon, uh, in fact, uh, uh, who was an economist uh, at, uh, uh, at the University of uh, Chicago, uh, also uh, got into the field and later at Carnegie Mellon, uh, you know, sort of built one of the big centers for artificial intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, machine learning itself uh, comes from, uh, again, a very classical discipline in, uh, you know, optimization. So, so basically how to uh, optimize a function, uh, a mathematical function over some, uh, you know, uh, mathematical description of uh, of a feasible space, and it's um, uh, it broadly comes under the the field of what uh, classically is called uh, the the calculus of variations or variational calculus, and uh, machine learning is really and one application of uh, of this uh, this idea. So uh, and the the fundamental ideas in optimization are that uh, you know you use uh, uh, your it's like climbing a hill uh, so you use uh, the slope or the gradient uh, to direct uh, to give you the direction in which to keep taking steps until you get to the top of the hill and uh, and that can be actually described uh, as an algorithm and and implemented um, on and to run quickly on a computer. And what has happened is that uh, computers have become better and better at doing this. And so you're now able to optimize, uh, you know, uh, problems that uh, can be represented uh, mathematically, right? So next slide, please. Uh -huh. So the, the idea, uh, Underlying all of this is this notion of uh, of a neuron, uh, an, an artificial neuron, uh, which is uh, sometimes called a perceptron, where you have inputs, and uh, and the inputs are, are you know are uh, carrying certain weights with them, 
and those you could think of as synaptic waves and uh, and the uh, you know the the edges uh, uh, the arrows uh, that uh, carry those uh, are like synapses and they they are the uh, they they come into the neuron and then the neuron if the weights uh, add up to a critical value and uh, then uh, it triggers uh, a, uh, a, a kind of sigmoidal function, which then gives you an output that looks more like either it's a digital output, it's either a zero or a one, right? And, uh, and that's, uh, that's, you know, the, how a single neuron is, uh, is modeled. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? Now, the idea of using such a device to separate uh, a, a pattern, right? So here you, you have a pattern of blue dots and you have a pattern of orange dots. And uh, now the, 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 you want to use this neuron to uh, decide, uh, you know, which are the blue dots and which are the, the orange dots. And so uh, the, the function, uh, uh, the separation function that you can generate from a single neuron or a single perceptron is, is, a, a, is a line by which you separate the space into two halves. And, uh, and on one side, you have uh, what you think are the blue points. And on the other side, you think uh, is where the orange points fall. Now that's partially true in this picture, but as you can see, the separation is not very effective because you're, because you're only allowed to put a line as a separator. And uh, so you need something that's a little more sophisticated, a little more nonlinear, uh, so to speak. And so you go to the next slide, please. Uh, now, if you were to put two neurons, but also put them into two layers, uh, no, I mean, this is still in a single layer. You have two neurons. Now you're combining their, their inputs. Uh, now, you, instead of separating with a hyperplane, you can separate with this kind of a curve, right? And uh, now you see it gets slightly better at separating the blue and the orange points, but there are still some orange dots left in the blue region, right? So it's doing a pretty good job of capturing the blue dots, but uh, it is not uh, uh, separated out the orange dots entirely. Uh, can we go to the next, please? Now we've allowed three neurons, and now you see we are getting the separation we want, right? The orange dots are separated, the blue dots, are contained within this triangular type of curve, which is a closed curve, and you see uh, all the, uh, the blue dots are in there. So now you've been able to classify one pattern against another. And that's fundamentally what you know, your eyes and your brain can do for you and the question is how complex a, a computing infrastructure do you need to achieve the same separation? And in this case, we have shown that with three neurons, you could get the same type of pattern recognition, right? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Now here's a more complex pair of patterns where you have uh, these spiraled dots, right? The blue and the, the orange. And now your question is, how do you separate 
or what is the mathematical function that will allow you a classification of one versus the other, right? And uh, next slide, please. So it's a slightly harder example. Now you go to four neurons and you still have a very poor separation uh, of, uh, of the patterns. Next slide, please. You go to eight neurons and you can see that it's trying very hard to do the classification, but it's still not able to achieve it. Um, so you go, uh, next slide, please. Now you add two layers and here you have, have been able to find two different colored regions and you get the separation that you're trying to achieve, right? But you start, you look on the, the, the structure of the neural network up on the left and, um, and you see that it's starting to get quite complicated because you have eight layers. I mean, you have two layers of eight neurons and you have all the interconnections. And so each of these interconnections uh, have to be assigned a synaptic weight. And so there's a complex optimization problem. Can you move to the next one, please? So now you get to a slightly more complex uh, classification problem of how do you uh, actually recognize human level performance in facial verification and actually lo looking at, at something like a face, right? And differentiating. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, can we pop, move the slide forward, please? Uh, Mr. Vignesh, we've lost the PPT. Oh. Can you, can you forward this, please, uh, whoever's operating? To the next slide. Ah, there we go, right. Now here are two faces um, and these are celebrities. Uh, can you recognize them? Uh, they're obviously upside down. Uh, next slide. See, now they're very recognizable, right? Um, of course, uh, if I was in a live audience, I would have asked you, but, but I guess most of you would have observed by now that that's Angelina Jolie on the left and the Bollywood uh, actress uh, Rekha on the right. Yeah, so, um, so again, uh, facial recognition, uh, sometimes this orientation is a problem uh, for human uh, intelligence to, re to recognize, uh, but uh, for a machine, it should be fairly straightforward. So next slide. And um, I think uh, the, the text is uh, uh, self-explanatory, but uh, the fact that uh, you could train a neural network to recognize faces using um, but of course, the network becomes quite complicated. It's a nine layer deep neural network, which has almost uh, uh, 120 million parameters that have to be optimized. Uh, and can actually using this training, you could get an accuracy of almost 97, 98% in recognizing human faces is, uh, is the big achievement that was, uh, you know, achieved by the Facebook team uh, several years ago. Uh, 
based on a very large data set of 4 million uh, faces for uh, training training this this neural network right so next slide please so essentially uh, in this new ai world uh, what you need um, is um, uh, huge training sets and you need computing power for training right because um, uh, you know you have to run these uh, algorithms to 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 find all the optimal synaptic weights in a deep neural network which has many many uh, uh, connections and uh, uh, and that is that's been the the uh, that's where the fact that uh, computing power has advanced so rapidly has allowed us to achieve this type of deep learning and machine learning intelligence, um, particularly in the last maybe 15 years or so, because uh, that's when uh, you know, the, the hardware of computing became so much more sophisticated with, uh, with special processing units, uh, like the graphical processing units. Uh, can we move forward, please? So um, these types of uh, challenges now have come up, uh, you know, uh, and uh, every year uh, there is the uh, something known, it's like the World Cup, you know, the KDD Cup uh, for, uh, you know, discovery uh, using uh, data mining. And, um, and so some years back, uh, you know, companies like Strand and my colleagues at the Indian Institute of Science and so on were, were uh, you know, part of the winning teams. Uh, so uh, can we move forward, please? Next slide, yeah. Um, so uh, this whole area, this field of uh, artificial intelligence driven by uh, neural networks um, actually has had a long history and goes back, uh, as I was saying, to the theory of perceptrons and so on, which uh, you know is is roughly about a you know fifty or sixty year old field, um, and many of us were yeah, as uh, you know researchers in computer science and so on were, were have been working in this for for many decades now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, can we create, uh, um, you know, various types of uh, uh, artificial intelligence driven, uh, you know, solutions which, uh, uh, you know, can, 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 can these, machines actually adapt to new problems. Uh, so what if you change the problem, can, um, can, you, can you adapt them? And this is one of the big challenges in, in artificial intelligence, that is how to make them a little more adaptive and uh, to learn new situations quickly, right? Um, this, uh, these were some early uh, results of uh, deep mind which has become now of course uh, well, you know a part of the google uh, uh, family the alphabet family and um, the the deep mind group today uh, has solved even very interesting problems in biology as you know a couple of years back uh, or maybe just a little over a year ago there was the announcement of uh, alpha fold which uh, which can predict the three dimensional conformation of protein structures using uh, this type of deep learning methodology and alpha fold uh, has been developed by the same team the deep mind team at uh, uh, at google 
and uh, they have consistently now been able to predict uh, protein structure from sequence uh, by uh, by computational methods using using this type of machine learning. Uh, that was a big breakthrough, and in many ways, we are going to see uh, many applications in the life sciences and drug discovery and so forth going forward, uh, seeing this. Next slide, please. Um, as uh, Dr. Veena mentioned, I think uh, analytics and data science in precision medicine uh, is, uh, is a very strong and emerging theme. And uh, its use uh, for precision medicine in both in better uh, and very accurate diagnosis and, um, and also in selection of uh, treatment of uh, uh, patients based on uh, these uh, types of uh, machine learning methodologies is, uh, is, a, is, the, uh, how, is how we are starting to leverage all these new developments in artificial intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a little bit about uh, Strand itself and its evolution, how, how we uh, you know, started out essentially as a data analytics platform for informatics, uh, then um, you know, started uh, leveraging uh, you know, AI and machine learning and move that into diagnostics. And then more recently, particularly in partnership with HCG, have been involved more in uh, looking at uh, the uh, 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 use in, uh, in, in the clinic, right, and uh, for clinical uh, applications. So next slide, please. Uh, we started out uh, essentially by building all these machine learning tools for, uh, you know, for uh, looking at experimental data that uh, came from um, microarray uh, platforms uh, for gene expression and, uh, and then for uh, mass spectroscopy types of uh, data uh, uh, analysis for recognizing, uh, you know, the proteins and uh, 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 that, uh, um, you know, were in the samples uh, by looking at the mass spec uh, data. Uh, and uh, we've gone on to genome sequencing and looking at microscopy and several other imaging domains. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, there is uh, a lot of, uh, 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 you know, computational um, uh, you know, uh, I guess achievements uh, that have uh, come about uh, partly because of uh, uh, developing the right tools uh, and uh, being able to uh, code uh, many of these uh, AI ideas uh, uh, very efficiently and uh, for next generation sequencing, for example, uh, we are really now at the state of the art. And next slide, please. Can you move the slide forward? Okay. Next slide. Ah, there we go. Uh, in genomics interpretation work, uh, particularly for um, next generation sequencing and so on, 
uh, one of the big challenges uh, is uh, that you know the sequence throws up a lot of data and then you have to filter down that data until you can find specifically let's say for a for a situation where you're trying to profile a, a cancer patients uh, genomic uh, uh, somatic profile of uh, of the tumor tissue you would um, you would you know start out with with a large number of mutations that you would see uh, and you would have to use various ways of filtering until you could actually find the specific uh, mutations or variants uh, that could describe what has driven the cancer. And here you would also need to bring into play uh, an understanding of the various pathways and uh, uh, that uh, the biological pathways that would explain why these mutations are, or these variants are, are driving uh, the cancer. Right. Next slide. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, you know, in, in the whole sort of clinical workflow, right from um, sample to clinical report, uh, uh, there's a large number of uh, uh, applications of uh, artificial intelligence and analytics of various kinds that is used, including natural language processing in order to be able to, um, you know, understand what the literature is uh, pointing to and, uh, and building the interaction maps and the pathways that can lead to an understanding. Next slide, please. Um, and so finally, you would, you would actually be using uh, uh, all these tools to be able to actually come up with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the identification of, uh, of the uh, variants and, and how they would uh, lead to uh, a, a a diagnosis, right? Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, now, when, particularly in uh, partnership with HCG, there are many, many such, uh, um, you know, human interest stories around patients, and some of whom have been very brave to come forward and tell their stories, and how how genomics uh, and uh, this type of analysis has actually helped them. Uh, next slide, please. So to build all these platforms, uh, we've really had to put a lot of this uh, um, machine learning and AI methodologies into action. And next slide, please, yeah. It's, And, uh, and of course, uh, Strand uh, has been, uh, uh, you know, evolved out of uh, the Indian Institute of Science uh, some over 20 years ago. So it has uh, been one of the early pioneers in precision medicine in, of this kind. Next slide. And let me just end there with, uh, uh, some acknowledgements of the team uh, of founders who uh, have worked on this. And, and uh, these, these images are actually uh, rendered by an artificial intelligence, uh, you know, to, to give you as kind of an impressionist uh, feeling. And that is, uh, uh, you know, another direction in which uh, all this, uh, technology is leading uh, and um, and I believe that uh, you know the the applications in digital pathology I think uh, you know uh, Dr. Veena has already mentioned them uh, but I what I was hoping to do was to give you a, a feel for what is behind 
behind the uh, the magic, right? The, the the black box that actually produces uh, all of this, uh, uh, you, you know, new age uh, uh, tools for for the uh, pathologist uh, to use. And uh, maybe I'll just stop there, and um, uh, we can uh, spend a few minutes on Q and A if uh, if the time permits. So I'll leave it to Samia and Dr. Veena to let me know what they'd like to do. Uh, thank you, sir. That was an excellent uh, in-depth insight into AI and machine learning. Uh, so we can take up uh, any questions from our delegates. Uh, so Veena here. Yes. Uh, so I have a question. I mean, this is basically from a pathologist's point of view for all, uh, from all the pathologists. Sure. So the yeah. So the images that are generated are actually in a different format. Like each uh, image is in a different format. And how difficult or easy it is if we have to apply an AI algorithm on a uh, on a pathology image. We saw that you explained us about the, you know, the facial recognition and sure, other things. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I I had more contrived examples to to make it, uh, you know, to understand the the concept and how uh, how this pattern recognition works. But uh, but I think um, uh, you're right. I think for every and that's one of the challenges. Uh, of AI. I mean, today, uh, you know, for every uh, domain and every classification that, where we are, uh, which we're trying to build, uh, we would need uh, to get the right training sets, right? And we would need an expert annotator to be able to, to first take the, the raw images and and annotate them and so that the machine then can learn from the annotated training set uh, how how to classify right if uh, if that is not done uh, you know the the predictive power of the underlying AI is uh, is quite limited and this has been the biggest challenge right? You know, in um, so so, uh, for example, uh, uh, today, uh, you know, uh, we've been in discussions with uh, ICM at the Indian Institute of Science that uh, how do we, you know, uh, yeah, we've been particularly focused on radiology. Of course, radiology. Uh, I mean, what has happened in radiology? is slowly starting to happen in pathology as well, because that's sort of, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, more complex uh, uh, domain in, in pathology. But in radiology, for example, um, even with, uh, let's say, simple thing like x-rays, right, uh, uh, in ch and chest x-rays, uh, today there are very few training sets that are available. Uh, which are of, uh, let's say, of Indian patients, right? People will talk about having hundreds of thousands of x-rays, for example, chest x-rays for classifying COVID, uh, you know, um, you know, looking at him, finding the, uh, you know, trying to be able to say from the x-ray whether or not a patient has as COVID or TB or, you know, various uh, pulmonological uh, disorders. Um, but the fact is that we are training many of the AI uh, algorithms for doing such predictions on data that has come from international uh, uh, patient uh, pools and, uh, and most of the training data sets that are used are uh, are from uh, not from Indian patients, and and as we all know, you know, due to 
certain factors of particularly including you know air quality and so on uh, indian uh, chest x rays are a little bit different from from those that the ai algorithms have been trained on and uh, and so uh, i think what is going to be the most challenging uh, aspect and this is something that we've been in discussions with icmr on is how do we create gold standard uh, training data sets uh, from clinical centers all over the country and uh, and that can be uh, well curated and put together in an effective way so that uh, these types of AI methodologies can be developed on them. Now, obviously, with uh, uh, things like digital pathology, some of the, the large digital pathology uh, platform companies, uh, whether, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I know that, uh, for example, Mina and others have, you have worked uh, with the Philips uh, platforms and so on. There would be uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, they, they have been able to train uh, uh, their uh, AI engines on, on specific data sets. But as we generate more and more of uh, data from our digital platforms, I think it will be very exciting to be able to create repositories of these uh, images and use them for, uh, you know, for developing our own methodologies. I know that uh, Dr. Veena and others uh, were in, you know, in collaboration with some of our AI researchers at uh, Strand uh, to uh, to see how to, you know, improve on some of the standard sort of packaged. Uh, AI algorithms. Maybe we, Dr. Veena, you would like to say a word on that. Uh, absolutely, sir. I mean, you have given a wonderful insight into the application of AI uh, with the pathology images. Yet it's right. really challenging. And as you said, we need to have a robust input to get a good. So having a good set of training data, training images, and, a, and the brain behind these images, I mean, the pathologist who has to identify the areas which are of interest, and then training the algorithm and achieving a higher accuracy is important. And uh, I think this course is going to provide a platform or an insight into uh, how to apply these uh, in the clinical practice. Um. Uh, do we have any other questions? Anything regarding the uh, course program itself can also be asked. Uh, so I have uh, another uh, question, maybe a very naive one. Sure. Uh, uh, so you spoke about the, the different levels of neurons. So I think pathology images are little complex and they are multi-layered. So uh, I mean, uh, to achieve uh, accuracy as close to uh, the reading by a pathologist on a microscope. So what would be the level of neurons that uh, we need to you know, achieve or get? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. It's, it's something that has usually uh, gets established through experimental you know, mm -hmm. practice. Uh, but, uh, as, as we were showing, as, as examples got more and more complex, there were two things that we were doing. We were changing the number of layers and then also the number of neurons. And, um, and, um, and I think uh, it, uh, there's a little bit of art there on on how you 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 put that together. There is there are also more sophistications on the type of neural networks and um, uh, and uh, and there is also uh, uh, various uh, 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 
some two or three different types of uh, variations on on how you would uh, experiment with building the right type of uh, network. None of this is, uh, you know, that challenging anymore because uh, extraordinary um, open uh, source platforms have now been created. Um, you know, TensorFlow and all of these uh, platforms that are available uh, on um, Google and various other platforms uh, in the cloud uh, allow you to experiment and, and uh, build, uh, build these uh, uh, AI systems. And, uh, but again, you know, really the, the key is you have to have a set of images that, uh, that are uh, uh, well described and annotated and then uh, play with uh, the underlying architecture of the AI platforms to, to build uh, stronger and better predictive uh, models. And uh, once the AI is trained on a particular set, the question of uh, how it will do on images that uh, typically do well on images that are similar to the training set. If, uh, if they start seeing images that are different, then uh, how well can it actually uh, predict on uh, new types of images that it's looking at. And if uh, it is uh, able to, then, then, you know, we usually think of that as uh, the AI exhibiting some, some pretty uh, impressive sort of ability to, to go beyond just the pure, it's, it's not just uh, repeating what it has learned, but it is actually learning something new and it can, it, it, you know, it does have that ability to, to go a little bit beyond uh, just, you know, something that's just exactly like the training set it has looked at. And though those little uh, steps beyond our uh, exhibition of some levels of intelligence that, uh, that the machine has been able to exhibit, uh, but it, you know, we are far away from actually having the machine, you know, suddenly go from being trained on, you know, one set of images and then uh, being able to look at all kinds of uh, new pathologies and, and so on. So, so a lot depends on training it well on, on a good training set. And that's why creating good gold standard training sets is key to improving the field and making it advance. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's something that pathologists can own and actually uh, you know, develop their own field uh, much better. And, uh, and, you know, it, and it will be very important uh, uh, you know, that uh, that is kept in mind as part of, uh, part of what, uh, you know, one does. I mean, clearly, these uh, will be beyond the normal, you know, working uh, responsibilities within pathology departments. But for for actually improving the state of the art of technology for uh, digital pathology, I think that that will be very important. There are uh, programs now in place, and in particular, I'd like to mention that uh, IIT Jodhpur has now been given the responsibility to build one of the most uh, you know advanced centers for digital imaging based uh, uh, ai methodologies uh, this is part of the department of science and technology programs um, and um, dr vina i'll be happy to put you in touch with uh, uh, the group, it's, a, it's an innovation hub at IIT Jodhpur. And uh, perhaps we can also get some of the faculty from there to, to come and talk about uh, specific areas of, within medical imaging that, uh, that could be of interest uh, uh, to, uh, to the student group uh, here and also to some of the future courses that run through through the academy. 
Yang kul Sorry, I'm losing the audio here. Maybe I'll turn off the camera. So. That would be really nice, sir. And thank you so much. You have given such wonderful insights. Sure. Uh, Doctor. Go on, Soumya. Go on, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Bakul, would you like to say a few words? Hello, I'm Oliver. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, so the uh, uh, digital technology, right? So generally, our main focus uh, on the AI today, right? So what is AI? Is a magic or it's really being the good result, bad result? So I just want to give a little bit about uh, concern about the practitioner. Look, uh, so I have discussed some, not just for the digital pathology, but also for the different radiologists and some orthopedics and working on these AI tools and uh, advanced techniques. So they worry that if this technique, they do not rely or they do not want to accept the decision made by this uh, AI based technology. So they are but worried both from their insight and also from the ethical point of view. Okay. But when I look at the uh, computer scientists, they directly jump on the diagnosis. Okay, they diagnose the disease. Okay, we diagnose the COVID, we diagnose this uh, breast cancer, we diagnose the, some tumor in the brain. So it is very popular because the data set is quite available. But the main worry about the uh, doctor side, they do not accept the decision. So what exactly doctor want, I come to know that they want assistance. Okay, does this software or AI technique give you the, some assistance? Then they are very well accepted. They can assist her in diagnosis. So final authority of decision is with the doctor. So as I, I uh, understand that uh, if we look doctor, uh, like pathologist look from the assisting point of view rather than diagnosis. So like quantification of Right. Uh, right. Uh, nuclei in the like one image uh, histopathological slide. So quantification. So quantification is a headache, tedious job for the technician or pathologist, right? So better focus on that kind of technologies and solution, and that could be useful. So doctor is not worried, and from the com data science and computer science point of view, we need to build a tool toward the assistant. Don't do not need to jump directly on the diagnosis. Okay, there are many right. other challenges. Yeah, so hopefully uh, we found this uh, helpful for both as a data scientist as well as the uh, as a pathologist. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, I'll also just uh, say a couple of things there. Uh, well, first of all, I I actually completely concur with you that uh, I think it is very um, uh, you know, important to keep in mind that uh, what uh, we are providing with this AI is uh, never uh, really a solution all the way to, uh, you know, to, uh, to a real diagnosis. We can only, uh, you know, provide uh, some hints, right? Uh, and, um, you know, and in fact, I, I normally always uh, try to make a comment that um, AI should not be thought of as artificial intelligence. We should really think of it as augmented intelligence, right? Yeah. So, uh, so we are really trying to augment the intelligence of the pathologist or the radiologist or, uh, or the you know, medical geneticist um, and uh, provide better tools so that they can, they can do a better diagnosis or their productivity can be improved and maybe in um, you know 80 percent of the cases uh, the the machine can actually produce a, a, a reasonably good classification which is close to a diagnosis and does not require too much of a 
intervention. But in 20% of the cases, there may be a requirement for the expert, uh, you know, to to really sort out, uh, you know, what what the true diagnosis is, and it, it goes back to to actually human intelligence. And so, from that uh, perspective, I think uh, we should really be thinking of AI uh, as augmented intelligence and not not uh, artificial intelligence, right? So, the idea of, uh, in some sense. Uh, uh, helping uh, the the real uh, decision maker, I think being uh, being more effective is is the is the role that technology should play, and and it would be arrogant of uh, computer scientists to to think that they can replace uh, you know the uh, the expert. Right? So. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so AI is, uh, that means AI is only a complement to the pathologist and it is not a competition. And uh, it's high time we pathologist uh, embrace digital pathology as well as computational pathology. It is only going to make our life easier. Uh, exactly. So, uh, we have yeah. come to the end of the session then, if there are no other questions. And Dr. Sandeep would like to add anything to the discussion. Uh, yeah, hi, Dr. Veena. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, making me a uh, part of this uh, uh, wonderful session on um, uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, obviously, in um, hematological oncology, there has been uh, lots and lots of... We have been using um, AI from ages, right? From uh, like you know, um, classifying cells, identifying the different uh, cells. It's a simple CBC report is, uh, in fact, an AI you know, that, that we are able to distinguish uh, lymphocytes from neutrophils and monocytes. And now we have uh, sort of like uh, come to an era where um, the flow cytometry data are, um, you know, is being uh, uh, interpreted. Uh, there is automated gating and um, uh, cell sorting happening, and we are able to uh, the uh, the uh, software and the advances in the equipments. They are able to, uh, uh, um, you know, identify accurately in at least 97 to 98 percent of uh, cases what subtype of lymphomas are we dealing with and what subtype of uh, leukemias are we dealing with. So. Uh, this is uh, going to be a, a fantastic and uh, exciting uh, course and uh, I look forward to interact with everyone and to share as well as to gain uh, lots of uh, knowledge in uh, this course. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. So just to yeah, emphasize, uh, so finally, uh, you will be again reviewing those images and then signing out, right? Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this has always yeah. been a problem with pathologists because uh, uh, that is why the acceptance of uh, AI, AI, digital pathology and AI has been so slow because pathologists started feeling that is, is, this is going to replace the pathologist. So they're going to run out of their jobs, as Dr. Bakul rightly said. But I think it's high time that we understand and as, I, as rightly put forward by Dr. Ravi Chandru, it is augmented intelligence and not artificial intelligence. So yeah, exactly. I agree with you, uh, Dr. Veena. And I think, uh, like uh, Sir said, in around 80 to 90 percent of cases, we can um, uh, sort of uh, you know, let the machine uh, uh, sort of uh, sign out the reports for us. And it's only in those another 20 percent where there is uh, so much of a morphological uh, variability and the different morphological patterns. That's where uh, probably uh, we are needed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, Dr. Song. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so that's the end of our uh, session and discussion. So I'd like to uh, express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates and participants of the webinar for their presence. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Vijay Chandru, Dr. Veena, Dr. Sandeep, and Dr. Bakul. Uh, the participants interested in uh, registering for the, uh, the digital pathology course can uh, contact the uh, global health. Uh, 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 Global Health uh, Healthcare Academy on the these given uh, uh, email IDs as well as the phone numbers. Uh, you can contact Mr. Vignesh uh, or uh, Sumana. And okay. also thanks to the uh, team GHA for uh, making this uh, webinar a success. It was wonderfully conducted. Thank you.
thank you dr yeah. somya thank you uh, very yeah. sincere thanks uh, to dr vijay chandru sir for sharing such wonderful insights and taking yeah. us through from the basics to the uh, current applications so thank you so much sir it was a very wonderful presentation thank you thank you you most welcome and i apologize for the uh, difficulties with the machine but i think uh, yeah thank you for helping to solve the traffic right uh, yeah thank Take you so much thank you. have a great weekend everybody thank, thank you. you thank bye you bye bye everybody thank you thank you thank you, thank you dr bakul dr sandi dr thank somya you, the moderator sure. thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. anita bye -bye. and team vignesh joseph sumana everybody thank you so